always. We ask the questions. What is needed in the world? He's known as Bobby Wine. Ugandan pop star turned politician Robert Chikulani made headlines after being detained on August the 14th. He was charged with treason, accused of throwing stones at President Yoweri Museveni's presidential motorcade. After release on bail, Chikulani said he was tortured by security forces. He was again detained before being allowed to seek medical treatment in the United States. I'm Andy Gallagher in Washington, D.C. Robert Chagulani has just been released from hospital and is ready to talk about the accusations made against him by the Ugandan government, his detention and alleged torture. Robert Chagulani, Bobby Wine, talks to Al Jazeera. Let's start with the events of last month. You were arrested twice, uh, firstly for throwing stones at the presidential motorcade and then Secondly, you were arrested and charged with treason. Your driver was shot and killed in, in what you think was an assassination attempt, and then you say you were brutally tortured uh, by the security forces. What happened? Well, a lot happened. Like you said, I was uh, brutally arrested, beaten terribly, then tortured further in the car, and uh, charged for illegal um, possession of firearms, a charge that was later dropped by the government itself and then later charged with treason. So, in my opinion, it was more of persecution than prosecution. But the beating, you said it was with an iron bar, it sounds like it was almost a, a sexual assault in parts from what you've, you've said before. Who carried that out and why? Um, the section of the military called the Special Forces Command um, the section of the military is charged with guarding the president and is actually led by the president's son, um, carried out all those atrocities on me, beat me with an iron bar, with an iron bar, beat me with gun butts, squeezed my testicles and, uh, you know, did all unspeakable things to me. One uh, commentator in Uganda said that in some ways, as unfortunate as this event was, it was almost your baptism, it's, it's, it's given you a higher profile. And they said, now your supporters will be watching because of your profile. What's your next move? What do you do now? Well, we've always been wanting a free Uganda, but that free Uganda should not come at the cost of torture, should not come at the cost of murder or, you know, illegal executions. It should be got free because our generation feels like the price has always uh, the price has already been paid um, for President Museveni to come in power. We lost more than half a million people in what he said uh, was a liberation. Now that liberation does not make sense to us because we are met with brutal force every time we try to raise our voices, every time we try to. Um, seek for the change that we know we constitutionally deserve. Now you're here to get medical treatment. One of your major concerns is, is to get your blood tested because you didn't trust what the doctors were injecting you with yeah. in Uganda. Will there be any long-term effects to your health, do you think? Um, I don't know. I'm still waiting for the results um, so I can know what is actually in my blood. I've gotten treatment. Um, as you can see, many of the wounds have healed and uh, uh, I've graduated from using clutches to just a walking, skit, a walking stick. Physically, I'm getting better. I wish I would be free in the blood like I am beginning to be free physically. Now, when you were detained, I believe around 32 other people were detained. You say uh, some of those were, were tortured as well, women among them. Could you have done more? Should you have done more for them? Could you have flown them here, perhaps, to get medical treatment? I wish I could do it. Um, like I always tell my friends, I feel humbled that my brutalization attracted the attention of friends across the world. But at the same time, I feel indebted to the men and women that have endured similar torture over the years, in particular, the people that were arrested together with me were so brutalized. I remember a lady called uh, Asiro 
she had just had a baby with, uh, by a cesarean section, but she was beaten so much that even by the time I left Uganda, she was still passing blood in her privates. There's another guy called Atiku. Doctor told us, doctors told us he will never be able to walk. There's another young lady called Sauda Madada. I left her in hospital. Um, my family and I myself uh, believe that it was important to save my life and because I am lucky to have the resources that can bring me to America for further treatment, I feel like this is a right that everybody else deserves. And that is why I try as much as possible to use this remaining time as I still live to raise my voice, to speak for those people, to make sure that what happened to me and what happened, what happened to my colleagues does not happen to any other Ugandan because nobody deserves this. I believe what can be done is not just to be done by me. Um, what I have is the voice to raise the plight of Ugandans, but I continue to call upon Ugandans, especially the young Ugandans, to speak up. The more we unite, the stronger we'll become, the stronger we become. Um, today, the regime seems to be shaking simply because Ugandans are more united. And it's the call that I continue to call upon Ugandans to stand, to be resilient, and to continuously demand for the dignity that they deserve. You're facing a president who has been in power since 1986, has removed term limits, removed age limits, and plans to run again in 2021. How do you take on someone like that that seems to have such a grip on power? I know that uh, we are facing a president who came to power when I was only four years. But I also know that the population of Uganda is over 85 percent under the age of 35. I know that it is many people like me who share the same dreams and aspiration for a better country, a country where the citizen will be the true master and the leaders are going to be servants, a country where when you work hard, you achieve. So we share the same pain, we share the same oppression. And I believe that our numbers are not such a lie. I believe that the dreams we hold together, the aspirations we hold together are much stronger than the fear and uh, terror that has been unleashed to us. So much as our president has the guns, much as they have the ferocious forces, we have the dreams that we hold together and nothing can stop us from achieving what we want to achieve. By running as an independent politician, is there a concern that you, by not joining one of the main parties, you may split the vote or you may sow a cord and, and make things harder? by not having joined one of the main parties, by not adding your voice to someone that's already established? When I was joining uh, politics, or what anybody would love to call politics, I looked at not the divisions that we're having. I looked at the plight that we share together. Today, Uganda is split into two types of people, the oppressors and the oppressed. So many people are oppressed regardless of what political party, tribe, or religion they belong to. Many people are oppressed even when they belong to the ruling party. So our desire as the oppressed people is to redeem ourselves. And we know that we are continuously being joined by people from across the divide, from all political parties, from all tribes, and from all religions. So what unites us is not the identities of the political parties or sections that we belong to, no, but the desire of freedom and liberty that we have as a nation is what unites us. But how do you turn those desires, those wishes, that, that, that longing for change into real political change in your country? Because the challenges are, are, are huge against a president who seems to want to stay in power for as long as he lives. Well, the challenges are huge, but we are very, a very optimistic generation. We know that we have nothing to lose apart from a useless life. We know that we are millions and millions of young professionals, doctors, lawyers, teachers, who can't make sense out of life. We know that we are together with groups, hundreds of thousands of elders who are continuously being embarrassed by the way things are going. 
you know, we know that even the uh, young people in the armed forces, young people in the police and civil servants, all desire change. Now, I know you're planning to go back home in a few days' time. These treason charges are still outstanding. It seems to me that you're a marked man. Are you fearful about returning home? Well, I'll be honest, yes, I'm fearful as a person, but I don't have another country. Uganda is my country. So I either live in a dignified country or I be remembered as a Ugandan who died trying to make a better Uganda. You're talking about your own death there. Is that something, is that a possibility that you're aware of as a father with four children, as someone who is a loyal Ugandan? I love my family so much. I love my country. But I also know that just less than 48 hours ago, one of my best friends was shot dead simply because he dared to speak truth to power. So many people die even without saying a thing. So it's important for me to raise the voice for as long as I can. Do you feel like you're qualified to, to lead these people? Do you feel like you have what it takes to be a leader? I believe that everybody can play a role. I'm only trying to play a role as a person. I grew up from the ghetto and I was elevated by the common people, the Ugandans, that gave me this platform. And that is why I'm talking to you today. So I believe that I can only play my role in its tiny position. And by encouraging all the millions of Ugandans for each of them to keep playing their role. You say you're playing a tiny role. What if that role, let's play the scenario out, means that you become the next president of Uganda? Do you want that job? I want to be a Ugandan that lives in a free Uganda. It does not matter who the president will be. As of now, nobody is free. I want to be free. And every Ugandan wants to be free, regardless of who the president is. How do you get from the scenario that Uganda is in now to that point where you can translate all that energy and that, and that need for change to actual change, because it, it feels like an insurmountable task right now. Yeah, it's a, an insurmountable task. But I believe that by changing the minds of people to look at themselves as a contribution, it's important to have a young population that can be two things, either can be a liability to Uganda or can be an asset to Uganda. It depends on how they are channeled. But most importantly, for all of us to embrace our country and know that we are not each, other, each other's enemy, regardless of what political party they belong to, regardless of their age, regardless of their religion or tribe, that is what we desire. And I'm sure we'll get that. You could have easily made the choice to stay as an actor, as a, as a well-known, famous musician, making lots of money, having a comfortable life. You chose the path to go into politics. Why? I cannot be comfortable or I cannot pretend to be free and comfortable when Uganda is not. When the ghetto boys and girls who I grew up with continue to die every day, we lose 18 women in hospitals every day giving back. We lose more than 300 children under the age of five. These are not relatives or friends or anybody known to the people in higher classes. These are people known to me. Now, having been lifted through that life and offered this opportunity to speak for them, I always feel like when I speak, their voice of millions and millions is echoing through me. So I cannot be selfish to deny them that. But again, that sounds like you could very well end up being the leader of this country going forward. Are you ready for the sacrifices of what that position will hold? Well, whether I'm ready or not ready for the sacrifices looks like I don't have a choice. You did have a choice. You could have stayed as a musician, as an actor, and not gone into politics. But the calling for you, that need to help change the country, is just something that's so at the core of who you are that you, you felt like you had to go forward and, and throw your hat into the political ring.
Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, it's me doing this interview. But I want to remind you that so many gallant Ugandans, young and old, men and women, have dared to speak out. Many have paid the ultimate price. Many have uh, disappeared in unknown jails. Many have been maimed, uh, tortured, and everything. I'm only here communicating. So it does not begin with me. And indeed, it does not end with me. I'm only trying to build on the blocks that many Ugandans have built on. Many Ugandans have, have paid a price. You don't really have any political experience. Uganda has enormous problems, poverty being among one of the worst. What would you do to improve the plight of your own people? What specific policies or approaches would you have? Um, we have so many patriotic Ugandans, very many schooled, intelligent men and women with very beautiful and progressive policies and proposals that they've brought on the table. But they do not have the ability to implement them because of the rampant corruption, because all the power has been concentrated in the presidency. I believe that once Uganda is free, all talented Ugandans will be able to offer what they can offer to the country. All they desire is the opportunity to offer their talents and knowledge to our country. This kind of change that you want to see to a more free Uganda, to a more democratic Uganda, more often than not in the continent of Africa, doesn't go well, doesn't go peacefully. Often people lose their lives in large numbers. Do you hope it will be different in Uganda? And if so, how would you make that transition? I really hope it will be different. I've seen transformation in countries um, bloodlessly. I've seen uh, peaceful transitions in our neighbors, Tanzania and Kenya. I've seen uh, Ghana. I've seen um, various places. But I've also seen um, situation like, situations like in Burkina Faso where the people take charge of their country. So we have seen it happen elsewhere. And indeed it can happen in Uganda. I only hope that our president can respect the people of Uganda and indeed be the first government to listen to the voice of reason, to be the first government to respect the people. Do you think President Museveni is scared of you? Well, like I said, this is not about me. It's not about me but at all. But in so many ways it is about you. You're the, the person that's been elevated because of your fame, because of your popularity among young people. So in many ways, if you are representing this desire for change, it is about you in so many ways. So do you think he has reason to fear you? If I was him, I would rather respect me than fear me. I'd rather listen to me than fear me. So would you like because to sit whatever, down and, and talk to him perhaps? Wh whatever or? is there to fear is not in me. It is in the people of Uganda. So would you sit down and talk with him about what the people want, about a desire for change? Is that something he would be open to? Or do you think he just isn't somebody that would do that? I think the cry has been very clear. Not only from me, but from all angles of Uganda. And it would only be decent to our president to listen to the cry of the people. Is he someone that's willing to listen to the people? In my opinion, the more our leaders stay in power, is the more they get insulated from the realities around themselves, is the more they get disconnected uh, to the people. And that's why when young people rise, he calls us uh, terrorists, um, he calls us uh, detractors. Um, I mean, he yeah. said, your claims that you were beaten up by his security forces are fake news. How do you react to that? It is surprising for the head of state um, to see that I was taken to the hospitals, uh, government hospitals, um, and indeed he also brought in a group of nine top doctors to examine me, and uh, indeed there was even a report of the Uganda Human Rights Commission that came out that he disregarded. But again, it's not the first time that our president is making such outrageous statements. We'll, with respect to him, 
I'll leave that at that. To give us an idea of, uh, for people watching around the world, what's life like in Uganda if you are a young person who's only ever known this one leader who, who feels this deep desire to change things? What's an average day like for someone living in a poor neighborhood in Kampala? Life is uncertain for the poor. You live in constant uncertainty, um, a situation where one wakes up and if they're lucky enough to have uh, lunch, they're not sure about dinner, where a young man or woman cannot guarantee a decent meal a day, a situation where when you work hard, you're not sure you're going to get paid, a situation where the system works only for the lucky few. And for those lucky few, they have to depend or to belong to a certain class or a certain tribe or a certain, or be somehow close to the presidency. What would stop you if you did come to power? I know I keep going back to this point, but it seems like it's a possibility. What would stop you from becoming like the president is now? What would stop you from becoming someone who just kept hold of power and uh, did away with term limits and just stayed in power and, and became the same as the man that you would replace? Well, that's a fear. Why? Because many of the things I'm saying today, our president said when he was my age. But I believe that if people are empowered to appoint, to elect and unelect a leader, if people have that power to decide who is their leader and who is not their leader, I think that would be the ultimate answer. Because I also know that power corrupts and corrupts absolutely. So what's important is to empower our people. It must be remembered that our president came to power through force of arms. And since then, people continuously get disempowered. So empowering our people is the only way we can confirm that never again will a president be a king in Uganda. One of the other reasons that you were in the United States, apart from getting medical treatment, was to talk to politicians here about the money that the US government gives to the Ugandan army. They rely on those security forces for the region. They give something like $800 million a year. You've been asking them not to do that. How have those meetings been going, and, and why do you want to see an end to that kind of funding? Um, for the record, I've met a um, couple of leaders, and I hope to meet more leaders. Um, I must note that I am thankful to the United States and indeed all other development partners for the cooperation they've had with Uganda. They've assisted us not only with the military, but with our fight in the, against HIV AIDS. They've assisted us with our education. And uh, indeed, they've supported our army home and away. But it's important, like I've said, especially to the United States taxpayer, to know that much of the military aid we get is actually used to oppress and brutalize the citizens of Uganda. I will note that the gun that killed my driver that could have probably killed me is an American gun. So the United States, and just like all other development partners, should be standing with the oppressed and not the oppressor should be standing with the people of Uganda and not simply the president, simply because um, our, our institutions have, have been, you know, disempowered. It worries not just we Ugandans, but it should be worrying the development partners um, because dealing with an individual is dangerous. What happens when that individual is not there? I think it's a, it should be a relationship between Uganda and America, not between Museveni and America. One last question. Are you hopeful for Uganda's future? I'm very hopeful for Uganda's future. I know that regardless of the oppression, I know that no matter how many people are tortured, imprisoned, or even killed, I know that freedom will come to Uganda someday. Robert Chalogani, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you very much for having me. Talk to Al Jazeera has asked Uganda's president for an interview. Yuweri Museveni's office said they'll pass on our request. We look forward to having him on our program in the near future. Yes.